Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's installment of the Reorg webinar series. Today we'll discuss recent Latin American Airlines Chapter 11 filings. I'm Kyle Ousu, Director of Emerging Markets Credit Research for America's Core Credit by Reorg. And joining me on today's webinar are Corporate Credit Analyst Catherine Wiegert and Senior Reporter Roberto Barros. Please note that an audio replay of today's webinar, as well as the slides from the presentation, will be available on the Reorg Media page by Monday for Reorg clients. You can also download the slides from the Resources List widget in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Today we will discuss the Latin American Airlines Capital Structures, Fleet Overviews, Chapter 11 Filings, and Key Related Issues. We will answer audience questions at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A widget located in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. So let's get started. So why invest in Latin American Airlines? What is it about these assets that attracts potential investors? I think at a high level, there's, there's two main reasons. And the first is growth, and the second has to do with market share. Uh, if you look at the charts below, um, they highlight uh, GDP per capita, population growth, and uh, in, uh, passengers um, from 2000 uh, to 2019. Um, and you'll see that there, there, there's been uh, tremendous growth in, in, in Latin America between that period. Um, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico's CAGRs um, from, from 2000 to 2019 with regard to GDP per capita, they were about 4.5%, 5.8%, 5.1%, 5 and 1.7% respectively, uh, whereas the U.S. and Europe were 3.1% to 3.9%. Um, now, with regard to market share, um, the, the U.S. And, and European markets are a lot less concentrated than the South American markets and the, 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 the Latin American markets, rather. Um, so, for example, the Japan Aircraft Development Corporation um, put out a, a report in March 2019 highlighting uh, passenger jet airplanes per capita um, for regions including Latin America, North America, and Europe. Um, Europe and North America are closer to 10, meaning te roughly 10 planes per 1 million passengers. Um, Latin America is closer to one, um, maybe two planes per, per million passenger. Um, so you see there that there's just a lot less um, planes that are available to, 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 to carry around passengers in Latin America. Um, further, when you look at uh, companies like LATAM Airlines, um, you know, 50 plus percent market shares in, in, in the Chilean domestic and international markets. Um, turning to a Brazil, you have uh, a company like Azul, um, which was the only operator on 70 percent of its routes. Um, Goal, uh, another Brazilian airline, represented 44% of flights coming out of Congonhas Airport, which is one of the main airports in Brazil. So, I mean, it, it just goes to show that in these regions, um, there's a lot less of what people really fear with the airline industry, which is excess competition. Um, now, on the flip side, when you look at the growth figures from 2010 to 2019, um, so stripping out some of the more the, the headier years um, of, 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 of commodities growth and et cetera, um, Brazil, Chile, uh, Colombia, and Mexico um, lag the U.S. and Europe. And so that's been, I think, a headache for investors. And, and so it's been tough to sort of time these growth cycles. But uh, I would say growth and market share are primarily the two things that uh, investors are attracted to when they're evaluating these investment opportunities in Latin American airlines. So in addition to the, the growth story um, that has somewhat, I would say, reversed uh, from 2010 to 2019 when you look at it compared with 2000 to 2010, um, another thing that I think keeps investors up at night um, is, is, is FX. Uh, you know, this is, this is the USD against the, the Brazilian real, and, and it's, it's, it's a little bit cherry-picking um, because the real, uh, you know, compared to some of the other currencies that we're looking at, um, you know, like the, the, the Chilean peso, the Colombian peso, has performed um, worse. Um, but at the same time, 
all of these, and by all I mean Chilean peso, Colombian peso, Mexican peso, all of these currencies have experienced um, volatility in, in 2018 and 2019. And, and for airline companies um, who have very high um, U.S. dollar denominated fixed costs because of the financing arrangements they enter to, into, because of the um, aircraft equipment that they need to pay for, or the maintenance, what have you, um, it's difficult when there's this much FX volatility. And so um, that's another thing that, 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 that investors need to monitor. I mean, I think before COVID, um, goals, 20, goals bonds, for example, traded um, pretty much in line with uh, the, the, the BRL. So when the BRL was deteriorating, um, goals bonds, at least for a bit until investors became a little more comfortable with the story, goals bonds were falling in line with that. And so I think that, again, FX is another um, just item that, that, that is at the forefront of investors' minds and, and will be at the forefront of investors' minds. Um, on the other hand, with regard to the dollar, um, you know, you're starting to see some people come out and say perhaps uh, there could be a, a long period of a weak dollar, which could help boost EM, um, that's way beyond my pay grade, but I think it suffices to say that over the next uh, five to ten years, um, investors in the airline space that have gotten involved through these restructurings are going to be actively watching and monitoring FX. So just to set the stage um, before we kick into, or before we begin, rather, our, our presentation, um, I just thought I would, I would um, set out a timeline of events. So, uh, you know, towards the beginning of the year, or sorry, we entered 2020 um, immediately after Avianca, uh, a Colombian airline, wrapped up um, its liability management exercise, which involved an exchange of unsecured notes for secured notes, and, and the company also raised cash. Um, from from a, a series of investors, including um, Citadel, um, and then three months later, the world you know the world changed. Um, who declared COVID uh, a global pandemic? Um, you, and then about uh, two months later, you had uh, the the South American countries um, quickly closing their borders uh, and. Um, a lot of the, or sorry, not a lot, I should say the airlines that we cover, so, so, so LATAM, uh, Aeromexico, Avianca, Gol, Azul, um, they all subsequently came out with uh, releases um, towards the end of March about capacity cuts, um, some of which involved, you know, 90 plus percent capacity cuts. So a lot of obvious pain and pressure uh, with the airlines and a lot of uncertainty during that time period. Um, fast forward to uh, early May, you had Avianca filing um, followed by LATAM Airlines and then Aeromexico. Um, and then, you know, we're continuing to work through uh, those Chapter 11 processes. And so uh, I will um, kick it over to my colleague, Roberto, who is going to uh, introduce the, those Chapter 11s by talking about um, some of the Chapter 11 advantages for airlines. Thank you, Kyle. So in Chapter 11, immediately upon filing, an automatic stay goes into effect. This allows for the uh, debtor to then use protections under the law to stabilize and propose a reorg plan. And once that's accepted, the debtor emerges as a going concern. The favorable provisions of the bankruptcy code include the ability of the debtor to obtain dip financing, uh, the ability to abandon aircraft and leases under Section 365 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code. Um, and it's also worth noting uh, that this ability to reject onerous leases is definitely not as present in Latin American jurisdictions. Um, in fact, some of the protections afforded to the debtors in countries, uh, including Brazil, um, have lost credibility in the in the legal sphere following the Avianca Brazil uh, restructuring. So a lot of the issues that um, relate to recognition will come up in the context of uh, recognition of foreign procedures according to the UN cross border insolvency model, um, and that's been enforced in enforced in Chile since. 2013, in Colombia since 20, 2006, and in Mexico since 1997. Brazil hasn't recognized it. 
With regards to Chile, Chilean recognition, the Chapter 11 recognition order for LATAM in the country was pretty quick and easy um, and was well drafted, according to sources. Um, though it's unusual for a court to change its mind, you have three separate parties that have filed claims against the order. Uh, the most serious of those is from Chile's State Defense Council. In Colombia, the recognition order was granted for LATAM's Chapter 11, with the U.S. as the main uh, center of interest. Um, Avianca, last we heard, had been waiting to see if there had been significant appeals to the LATAM recognition in order to file its own recognition order. Um, in Brazil, TAM, the Brazilian subsidiary of LATAM, um, was included in the Chapter 11 as a debtor. Um, Brazil doesn't recognize Chapter 11, so this creates the possibility of enforcement by creditors. In Mexico, um, Mexico was one of the first countries to adopt the Uncetral model uh, in 1997. Uh, in the first day motion, the debtors included the stipulation that foreign governmental authorities do not deny, revoke, or suspend any licenses or permits solely because, of the, because the debtors are in Chapter 11. Um, so at least on paper, there seems to be some protection in favor of the debtors. Uh, but one thing that's been pointed out um, is that apparently there have been at least one claim against the debtor in, uh, in Mexico. So in practice, we need to see how this plays out. Okay, so we've included um, Delta in the list of um, uh, companies that um, would potentially benefit from, from government aid initiatives, uh, obviously because of the CARES Act. Uh, in the U.S. and because of the fact that Delta has partnerships across the region, um, as we will uh, kind of discuss in, in more detail. Um, in terms of Chile, there wasn't anything concrete on government aid uh, and providing a bailout to LATAM. Um, it's become quite a, a political issue, um, and the government has so far talked about supporting its uh, citizens, including um, uh, allowing for people to take 10% from their pension fund savings um, instead of spending money, uh, government money, on one specific company. Uh, in Colombia, there are still ongoing discussions about the provision of support for Avianca specifically, uh, but a general decree was published in June allowing the government to invest in equity or debt instruments, even in situations where the government expects the investment may come at a loss. So it looks like indirectly it was aimed at Avianca, but there is nothing kind of explicit in the decree. Uh, it definitely fueled speculation, though, about an injection from the government. In Brazil, the negotiations between airlines and the development bank BNDS, as well as um, other banks, are ongoing. Um, it's worth noting that the BNDS and, and private and public banks are providing up to $600 million to Brazilian aircraft manufacturer Embraer. Um, and it's also worth noting that um, Goal said uh, on its earnings call that um, there's still work to do from an execution perspective, uh, but the structuring of a $400 million five-year debenture with the BNDS is, uh, was concluded. Um, so we should uh, uh, wait to see what, uh, what kind of happens there with regards to uh, potential support for the other airlines as well. So this slide shows the legal and financial representatives of Avianca, LATAM, and Aeromexico. Um, and now Catherine will uh, take us through um, some of the uh, issues with Aeromexico. Thanks, Roberto. Aeromexico filed for Chapter 11 on June 30th in the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of New York, reporting $1 billion to $10 billion in both assets and liabilities. The first day declaration filed by CFO Ricardo Javier Sanchez Baker explains that the debtors intend to use the Chapter 11 process to, quote, streamline the ongoing operations and reorganize pre-petition obligations. 
Our own Mexico's capital structure as of the petition date includes total bank debt of $367.9 million, fleet financing of $293.7 million, the $400 million 7% unsecured bonds due 2025, and local market financing of roughly $233 million for total debt of about $1.3 billion. The company pays an equivalent amount of, operate, of operating leases, so we estimate net debt, including the leases, around $2.4 billion and net leverage around 10 times. Uh, the largest unsecured creditors include the Bank of New York Mellon, the Mexico City International Airport, BBVA Mexico, HSBC Mexico, uh, several trade creditors, and then the BBVA uh, Frankfurt branch also has an outstanding short-term loan with the debtors as well. In terms of liquidity, the debtors had about $160 million in unrestricted cash on hand, while non-debtors well, non affiliates reported about $600,000 in cash as of the end of June. Turning to dip financing, Aero Mexico has been in negotiations regarding a delayed draw dip, which the debtors are seeking to approve within 30 days of the uh, pre-petition date to, quote, augment liquidity. The structure of the facility isn't quite clear yet, but based on court filings and some conversations we've had with people close to the situation, we know that Aero Mexico is considering one of a few options. The company may seek between $500 million and $700 million in financing that could come in the form of a single or dual tranche facility. And we also understand that a dual tranche structure could basically entail a $200 million upfront investment followed by a larger $300 to $500 million uh, capital injection, depending on the size of, of the final facility. We've also been told that Aero Mexico is negotiating with several parties, including another, a bondholder group represented by Aiken Gump, BTG Pactwell, Ducera, uh, to potentially provide up to $200 million in dip financing. In court, fi in court filings, advisors to the debtors have said they are cautiously optimistic that they will file a motion for a final dip approval uh, before the next hearing on August 19th. As part of the restructuring, Aero Mexico filed a motion this month to approve a restructuring agreement with holders of two series of short-term Mexican stock certificates representing about $240 million of outstanding debt. The settlement provides for, among other things, the deferral of amortization payments for 18 months, an amended payment schedule, continued payment of accrued interest on each payment date, and the waiver of events of default related to the commencement of the Chapter 11 cases. It also allows the Aero Mexico Group to access certain credit card receivables arising from Visa and MasterCard transactions with travel agencies and sales offices in Mexico. Essentially, the deal extends the maturity on the the so-called Aramex CV17 trust certificates, certificates to March 24th uh, uh, from September 2022, and the maturity of the Aramex CV19 trust certificates to December 2025 from June 2024. The amortization payments on the Aramex CV17 trust certificates would also resume in March 2022 in 25 equal, in equal consecutive monthly payments amounting to about 100 million pesos. The amortization, the amortization payments on the Aramex CB19 trust certificates would resume in July 2023 in 30 payments totaling about 88.3 million pesos. Okay, so now turning to the fleet. Aero Mexico has 118 aircraft in its fleet as of the end of the second quarter, excluding the six 737 MAX airplanes that have been grounded. The fleet is divided basically into two categories or services. Aero Mexico mid-range and long-haul flights that are operated with a mix of Boeing 737 and 787 aircraft and the Aero Mexico Connect, which provides regional service throughout Mexico, the Caribbean, and the U.S. with short-haul and rare aircraft. The first day declarations uh, do note that Aero Mexico has a surplus of aircraft in its fleet and giving project, given the projected decline in demand. Uh, to that end, uh, Judge Shelley Chapman uh, entered an order on July 23rd authorizing the debtors to, re to reject leases or otherwise abandon excess equipment, including leases on over a dozen planes. By way of operations, Aero Mexico's main hubs are in Mexico City, Monterey, and Guadalajara, Mexico. The company provides service to 42 destinations in Mexico, 20 destinations in the U.S. and Canada, 15 destinations in Central and South America and the Caribbean, five destinations in Europe, and two destinations in Asia. Last year, Aero Mexico carried about 20.7 million passengers and maintained a 24% market share of the, domestic, of the domestic Mexican market and about a 15.8% share of the Mexican international market. Delta maintains a 51% stake in Aero Mexico shares and holds 49% of the voting rights. 
There's also cross-pollination in, in the management structure. Some Aeromexico executives, including the chief operations officer and the chief commercial officer, uh, formerly held positions at Delta. Together, Aeromexico and Delta operate flights between the U.S. and Mexico under a joint cooperation agreement called the Delta JCA. And collectively, the two airlines have transported more than 20 million passengers on cross-border routes between 2017 and 2020. The JCA represents, according to the debtors, the largest cross-border partnership between Mexican and U.S. airlines that, it, that is expected to grow in the coming years in terms of flight offering and benefits uh, to passengers in both the airlines. Aeromexico also has a loyalty program that is run through a non-debtor subsidiary called PLM, which is a joint venture between Aeromexico and a separate firm, Aeroplan Holdings, which operates Aeromexico's Club Premier loyalty program. Uh, right now, Aeromexico owns about 51% of PLM, and Aeroplan Holdings um, owns the remainder. As of the petition date, the program had about 6.7 million members, uh, more than doubling in size since inception in 2011. In addition to its passenger service, Aeromexico operates cargo activities, which are handled out of the Aeromexico cargo subsidiary. The unit generates revenue through traditional cargo services and through the commercialization of storage space inside the customs facility at Mexico City International Airport. Air cargo revenue represented 6.7% of consolidated 2019 revenue, and the storage services contributed to about 4% of the total cargo revenue. Now Kyle is going to walk us through Avianca. Turning to uh, Avianca, um, you've got about $5.2 billion of secured debt and about $5.4 billion of total debt. Um, the $484 million of new secured notes were the result of an exchange where uh, that took place at the end of December, whereby the company um, exchanged uh, $550 million of unsecured bonds for four hundred eighty for for 484 million of new secured notes, and then you've got the 66 million of holdouts. Um, you've also you've also got 375 million of new money that came in as a result of the, uh, those liability management exercises. So 250 million from Kingsland and United, 75 million from a group of Latin American investors, and 50 million from Citadel. The senior secured note collateral includes residual aircraft value, IP and a first lien over eight Mexico aircraft that are owned by Tampa Cargo AS, SAS. Um, and then the, the, the Kingsland United Stakeholder Loan and the in Incremental Secured Convertible Loans are secured by uh, pledge agreements um, over Avianca's equity interest in certain subsidiaries, including Life Miles, uh, the loyalty program, which is a non-debtor in these Chapter 11 proceedings, as well as credit card receivables and a trust collection over certain other receivables. And then the Citadel um, notes are secured by a, a, a pledge agreement um, over Avianca's equity interest in certain subsidiaries, um, credit, credit card receivables, and um, uh, trust collection over certain sales receivables, and a cash collateral account, and, and fiduciary rights, a pledge over fiduciary rights, rather. Um, and the reason that I point out this collateral is um, the, the, the debtor, uh, before filing, of course, the world was completely different in, in, in December, but the debtor before filing um, pledged some unencumbered collateral um, to its stakeholders in order to uh, secure liquidity and push out maturities. Um, and so it remains to be seen um, what impact that has on raising dip financing. Um, but as, as, I will allude, as, I, as I will show in the next slide, I mean, the, the, the dip financing negotiations um, are going on. That brings me to Avianca's dip financing. Um, so on August 11th, there was a motion filed, uh, and according to the motion, um, Goldman, the plan is that Goldman and J.P. Morgan um, will act as co-leads on a $900 million tranche A financing, with Seabury Securities as the sole lead on a $700 million junior tranche B financing. Um, the, the motion says that the debtor has made uh, significant progress towards obtaining commitment for a portion of financing needs, including the entirety of um, the uh, 700 million junior tranche B. Um, but, and I apologize, there is a mistake in that slide. It should read a portion of the 900 million tranche A dip remains uncommitted. So that gives you a sense for 
the type of financing or the, the, the type of funding Avianca is seeking um, sort of alludes to, again, this $1.6 billion multi-tranche dip. Um, and you saw the, the, the multi-tranche dip concept in LATAM. You're seeing it potentially in Aeromexico. So it seems to be um, the type of funding that the, the, the Latin American airlines are seeking um, to, to, to uh, raise cash for their, their Chapter 11s. So two, two themes that we've seen emerge um, from these Chapter 11 cases, and it's not surprising given the state of the industry, but um, the, the debtors uh, have sort of quickly sought dip financing or tried to negotiate dip financing, and they've also uh, rejected contracts or, 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 or sought, sought authorization, I should say, to reject contracts um, that, they de that the debtors deem to be too burdensome or onerous for the estate. Um, and so on June 23rd, uh, Avianca filed a motion seeking an order authorizing the rejection of certain um, USAV agreements. And these USAV agreements are regarding uh, credit card receivables. So the debtors um, provide USAV, which is an, a special purpose entity, uh, with certain credit card receivables generated in the United States for $150 million plus monthly installments. And the way that the, the monthly installments work um, the, the, the monthly installments are equal to the amount of uh, credit card receivables that are generated in a payment period um, that exceeds the amounts that are needed for USAV to make monthly amortizations under a loan agreement um, with certain third-party lenders. Um, so in 2019, pre-COVID, um, on average, Avianca produced about $54 million um, in monthly credit card receivables, and of that, about $49 million was passed on to Avianca in the form of this additional um, purchase price. And, and again, I, I spoke to these third-party lenders. Um, so the, the, there is a USAV secured lender group. They filed um, their, their Rule 2019 statement on July 23rd. Um, according to that document, um, as of July 22nd, the group held $80.9 million of the USAV secured loan. Um, and the leaders of that group, as measured by the amount of the loan that they own, you've got Deutsche Bank with $18.1 million, um, Banco de, de Credito del Peru with $14 million, and Moneda with $13.5 million. So here you see Avianca's fleet as of December 31st, 2019, sort of a pre-COVID snapshot, if you will. Um, the fleet is, is, is definitely weighted towards Airbus aircraft, um, particularly the, the A320 and A319 narrow-body aircraft. Um, on, on, on July 7th, the, the debtor filed a, a second stipulation and order regarding lease rejections, again, a theme in these aircraft Chapter 11s. Um, the, the aircraft that are being rejected, there's a, a slew of A320s, um, I think about four A321s, um, three A330s, um, and a, a couple A319s. Um, the, the lease uh, rejection um, speaks to uh, a, a power by hour agreement, um, which involves um, rent based on actual aircraft utilization. So the idea being that the, the debtor would, would save a bit of money um, on rent if you know, for aircraft that the debtor is not flying as frequently. Um, with regard um, to claims, um, so, so to back up, at any time within 15 days notice, the debtor can reject the aircraft agreements or abandon equipment. And with regard to claims, um, you've got um, claims that would uh, be admin priority, and so those would be a breach of uh, the actual obligations under this stipulation. And then you would have claims against the debtors that are solely uh, pre-petition, non-admin priority claims. And, and those claims are, 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 would be broken up into um, any claim that would be entitled to admin expense or priority and payment but for the stipulation or PBH agreement. Um, two, any claims for the difference between the rent and maintenance payments um, that, are, that, that are supposed to be paid under the original aircraft agreements as compared to the rent and maintenance uh, payments under the modified aircraft agreements. Um, and then number three, uh, any claim pursuant to a breach um, of specified obligations that is uncured um, and results in the aircraft agreements being rejected or the original aircraft equipment 
um, being abandoned. So Avioca's main routes are uh, Bogota and San Salvador, um, but in the in the Avianca 2021 plan, the company stated that its real focus is going to be um, around Bogota, um, and so there's going to be an elimination of lower yielding flights uh, with a scale back in Central America, North America, and Peru. Um, Bogota, is, as I said, is the main hub. It accounted for about 61% of daily arrivals and departures as of fiscal 2019. Avianca's frequent flyer program, as I mentioned, is Life Miles. Um, there were 9.7 million members as of December 31st, 2019. Um, as I noted, Life Miles is a non-debtor in these proceedings. Um, and Avianca sold 30% of its Life Miles stakes to private equity uh, company Advent uh, for $343.7 million in August 2020. Here you have information about Avianca's cargo operations. Uh, obviously, the cargo operations of all of the debtors, uh, Avianca, Aeromexico, and, and Latam Airlines, um, have become uh, a lot more valuable um, due to COVID as uh, there is a lot more cargo activity with e-commerce uh, blowing up globally. Here we're showing the LATAM Airlines capital structure, and so we've moved on to the LATAM Airlines portion of the presentation. And, uh, you know, if, if, if um, Aeromexico is sort of characterized by its Mexican operations and Avianca more so by its Colombian operations, I think one thing to note with LATAM Airlines is it's really a, a, a pan-Latin American airline, so to speak. Um, it's Chilean-based, um, but one thing you'll hear me mention over and over throughout LATAM is uh, I'll make reference to uh, the company's scale and the company's um, you know, uh, global uh, nature. So going to the cap stack, you've got about $4.9 billion uh, of secured debt related to mostly to fleet financing. Um, you've got about $2.2 billion of unsecured debt. Um, that's the series um, A through E, Chile and law local bonds. You've got an unsecured bank loan, and you've got about $1.5 billion of New York law unsecured bonds. And then as of July 9th, um, the debtors had rejected $849 million of debt related to uh, finance, 18 finance leases. Um, and you also have the LATAM Brazil entity, um, LATAM Airlines Brazil, which uh, had a total of $524 million in uh, financial debt obligations. And that entity filed for Chapter 11 on July 9th. So LATAM Airlines is proposing a, a multi-tranche dip. Um, 1.3 billion tranche provided would be provided by Oak Tree, and a 900 million junior first loss tranche C would be provided by shareholders Qatar Airways and Costa Verde, which is an investment vehicle uh, for the Cueto family. Uh, there would also be uh, 250 million of incremental capacity that would be provided by shareholders. The dip is being contested by Knighthead and an ad hoc group of bondholders, and they're proposing to provide um, a 1.3 billion tranche A and a 900 million tranche C, um, where Jeffries would act in its capacity as administrative collateral agent. Of course, the dip, there are differences between the two dips in terms of um, the, the terms and the, the conditions and the payments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, the, the, the dip is contentious. Um, both sides are arguing um, the bondholders' main argument is that this dip is an insider transaction that was the result of a process dominated by Delta uh, and that the equity subscription election basically locked shareholders into a 20% discount. Um, the, the debtors argue that there is no uh, baking in a discount um, for shareholders simply on account of them being shareholders, which would be a violation of the absolute priority rule. Um, rather, you had an unprecedented situation with COVID. Um, the shareholders are uh, strategic players, and um, it was important for LATAM to raise financing from the shareholders before uh, filing the dip, or sorry, sorry, before filing Chapter 11, um, because it needed to, to shore up liquidity um, at a time where, again, you had an unprecedented situation due to COVID. And so the equity subscription election, um, the way that that works is that the debtor, um, the debtor has the choice um, to decide whether or not to uh, cash out uh, the, the junior creditors, or um, alternatively, uh, what happens is the lender turns in the loan and gets cashed out by the debtor. So it's not exactly a credit bid. Um, the debtor would repay the loan, and then the lender would take proceeds and then buy 
uh, restricted shares um, in a, a rights offering. And, and, and that was a, a distinction that uh, Lisa Schweitzer of Cleary Gottlieb on behalf of the debtors really hammered home during the, the proceedings in order to make the case that the tranche C offering does not predetermine the value that tranche C lenders will get um, in exchange for their, their, their tranche C loans. You've had the, the LATAM Airlines ad hoc group. They filed their, their Rule 2019 um, forms um, on, July, on June 28th. The ad hoc group uh, held $601.3 million. You can see that the group is, has grown. Um, the top three funds are Consorcio Financiero, Financiero with $191.6 million. You've got Double Line with $99.1 million, and then VR Global Partners with $65.6 million. So LATAM Airlines, um, uh, there was an order on the docket authorizing um, rejection. Uh, the purpose, again, is, is to abandon um, excess equipment and the claim. Um, in, th in this instance, um, it says that the order did not preju prejudice the rights of the lessor or lender um, to assert any secure, unsecured or secured claim, um, including a deficiency claim. Um, the, the text also uh, said that autom the automatic space of Section 362 will be amended um, to allow the lenders to exercise remedies against the lessors and LATAM's equity um, of the lessors. And so this particular motion um, is, is uh, regarding uh, LATAM's uh, double ETC uh, aircraft, and those aircraft are the subject of the double ETC uh, certificates and the way that those work, you, you have uh, special purpose vehicles um, that raised money uh, from stakeholders, from, from creditors, use those money, use that. Here you have a depiction of uh, LATAM Airlines fleet, again similar um, pre-COVID snapshot um, as of December 31st, uh, 2019. Um, and we spoke to uh, a source um, that said generally uh, appraisal values are about 35 to 50% lower um, than pre-COVID-19 levels um, and uh, provided valuations for Air 321 aircraft of about roughly 20 to 30 million, Air 3 A350 of about 80 million, and Boeing 787 of about 75 to 80 million. So again, when you when you think about LATAM's passenger operations, um, you know the, the the thing that comes to mind when you're when you're looking at it compared with some of the other um, Latin American airlines is scale. Um, you know the the, the the main hubs are in Sao Paulo, uh, in Guarulhos, um, and then Lima and Santiago. Um, this is the only airline group um, in South America with a domestic presence in six markets um, and long haul operations to five continents. Um, the company or the debtor rather at this point has um, key strategic routes uh, that it operates from 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 JFK uh, in New York so one example is you know a, a flight from JFK to Santiago a flight from JFK uh, to Guarulhos so um, you know again uh, just highlighting uh, LATAM scale and global nature here you see LATAM Airlines uh, market share um, and uh, I think I highlighted this at the beginning, but the, comp the, the debtor has 50-plus uh, percent market share in, in Chile, um, in, in both internationally and domestically. You've got um, a 63 percent domestic market share in, in Peru, and then um, the, the debtor is also um, a, a very one of, one of three um, main sort of aircraft operators in Brazil. So this is a slide detailing um, LATAM Airlines frequent flyer program. You'll see it's the fourth largest frequent flyer loyalty program measured by the member base, um, 37 million, around 37 million members as of June 30th, 2020. This is a slide uh, detailing LATAM Airlines cargo operations. And one thing to note um, is that LATAM Cargo Brazil is the market leader um, in Brazil ahead of Gol and Azul. Here's the Delta Framework Agreement. Um, in September 26, 2019, um, Delta came out with an announcement, a tender offer, partial tender, um, 16 a share for 20% of LATAM Airlines shares. Uh, you'll see the shares closed at 8.92. 
on September 20th, um, so quite quite the premium being paid. In addition, there would be $350 million of compensation uh, from Delta to LATAM um, for transition costs um, to transition onto the Delta onto Delta sort of platform. Um, and then Delta agreed to acquire uh, four aircraft A350 for an undisclosed amount. Um, that was that since terminated uh, for in exchange uh, for $63 million um, of compensation. Um, and this just highlights again the the, the strategic or, or sorry the the desirability um, of the Latin American region um, to some uh, strategic players. I mean, obviously Delta is a, a well-known world-class airline operator and agreed um, to pay a premium for LATAM because um, Delta felt it was a strategic asset uh, and. Um, Delta CEO Ed Bastian was quoted as saying the agreement adds geographic diversity in a fast-growing continent, adding 100 new destinations uh, to Delta's map. Uh, and once approved, the proposed JV will move Delta uh, from a current number four position in South America to a current number. So now we move to Goal and Azul, um, and it's, it's, I think one thing is important to, to note in terms of distinguishing the two by their strategies. Um, you know, Goal uh, has 44%, uh, 28.3%, and 42% of total flights at main airports, um, Congonia, Guarulhos, um, and Galeau, um, Galeau um, in, respectively, in 2019. Um, you know, the Goal, I think, focuses more on flying back and forth between these main routes um, and especially is especially dependent on the on business travel um, which accounted for I think around 70 percent of uh, or typically sorry accounts for around 20 70 percent of, of, of goals traffic now Azul as I mentioned is the only airline around 70 percent of its routes and has the most extensive route network in Brazil um, its growth strategy calls for increasing the number of markets served so where goal where goal aims to be sort of dominant in these main uh, these main hubs, the big cities. Um, Azul seeks to uh, sort of um, has the strategy of connecting um, everyone in Brazil, if you will. Here you have Goal's capital structure. Um, and I think one thing to note with, with, with Goal's capital structure is um, Goal has, uh, in order to fund its aircraft, um, it's financed its it, it, it fleet with entirely with operating leases, um, which, which I think gives, it gives, gives the company a bit of flexibility um, when it comes to uh, sort of negotiating um, with, 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 uh, with lessors. Um, the other thing to note uh, with regard um, to financing entirely with operating leases is relative to a cap stack that has a lot of, um, you know, maybe, uh, for example, double ETC, double ETC debt, um, Goal probably has uh, more um, in the way of unencumbered assets because, you know, again, the, the fleet's financed entirely with operating leases. The other thing to note about the capital structure is you've got the Delta August 2020 maturity looming. Um, this, was, this came up on the call. Um, Goal CFO Richard Lark um, essentially said that, yes, uh, an amend extend is a viable option, um, but of course uh, it will need Delta's approval. So it remains to be seen what happens with that. Um, that loan was provided in 2016. Um, at a time uh, where Goal uh, restructured out of court with, with holders getting a mix of cash and new notes. So here you have a liquidity update from Goal, and Goal and Azul have been providing these, these liquidity updates. Um, you know, Goal expects that its daily cash burn will be about BRL 6 billion, or 6 billion rei, sorry, um, per day. Uh, the company comes out and, and states that, or came out and stated that it had around 500 million Brazilian rei to about a billion, uh, primarily aeronautical, but also non-credit card receivables. Um, so this sort of just highlights um, what, the, what the company, or gives you a snapshot, rather, of what the company's liquidity picture looks like um, going forward. So this slide, this slide, I think, um, highlights the, the flexibility I was talking about. Uh, in the first half of 2020, Goal reduced its fleet um, by nine Boeing 737-800s and, er, and plans to return seven aircraft in the second half of 2020. Um, the company can reduce its fleet by 30 aircraft over 21 to 2022 um, and has contractual conditions to return more if the recovery is slower than expected.
So here, here you have some more detail on the Gold Delta Unsecured Term Loan, and again, uh, Gold CFO Richard Lark saying that another option would be to amend extend, but of course, Gold would need uh, the support of Delta. Uh, the Gold Delta ter relationship was terminated in late 2019, around the time that Delta made its investment um, in, in Latin Airlines. Um, and now I will uh, pass it over to my colleague, Catherine Wiegert, who is going to discuss Azul. Thanks, Kyle, and thanks everyone for sticking with us. Um, I'm going to go through Azul pretty quickly given uh, the time constraints, um, and also just given the fact that this is one of the better capitalized companies that we've been reviewing today. So um, I just don't think that it merits as much time as some of the other companies that we've looked at today. Um, but I'll begin with Azul's capital structure. Um, with about $4 billion in total debt, um, including lease liabilities, Azul's capital structure is slightly bigger than that of Gold's. Aircraft financing, working capital facilities, and local issues represent the lion's share of the total debt, amounting to about $883 million at current exchange rates. Azul also has a $400 million, 5 and 7 eighths senior unsecured bond outstanding that matures in 2024, and about $3 billion in operating lease liabilities for a total debt of about $4 billion. We estimate leverage at about 6.1 times, based on LTM EBITDA of about $653.6 million. Now with, uh, with respect to Azul's liquidity, Azul has about $3 billion reais in total liquidity, which includes receivables. That can be broken down further into $2.8 billion in cash and equivalents, including restricted cash, and short-term receivables of about $530 million. The company reports about $2.3 billion in deposits and maintenance reserves and $1.3 billion in reais in unencumbered assets. Taken together, Azul's management has uh, said the company has uh, sufficient resources to fund operations through 2021. They estimate uh, daily cash burn of about 3 million reais a day, which equates to approximately 1 billion reais a year. Instead of filing for Chapter 11 proceeding or, uh, or seeking protection in Brazil, Azul's management has said the company will raise cash, quote, in due time to enhance liquidity given the challenging operating environment and the uncertainty around a, a potential economic recovery in light of the COVID pandemic. In terms of fleet size, Azul had 303 aircraft in operation as of the end of June, including 127 Embraer airplanes and 72 ATR planes, both of which are used for short-haul flights. And then the company also had 104 Airbus planes for mid-range flights throughout Brazil. And earlier this week, Azul disclosed an agreement to reduce its lease payment schedule with 98% of its lessors uh, from April through December 2020 to about 77% of the original contract to account for lower demand. The company's new payment profile with its lessors is expected to provide approximately 3.2 billion reais in working capital relief until December 20, 2021. Also important to note, I think, is uh, looking ahead, the company expects lease liabilities to decline by about 3.4 billion reais uh, from the end of March to December, reaching 12.5 uh, billion reais by year end. Um, regarding the other 2% of the lessors that are not covered by this agreement, as well as it's still in negotiations, and we will be looking out for any additional developments regarding uh, these discussions. Okay, so for our last slide today, I have a quick summary of Azul's operations and specifically its relationship with the LATAM Airlines and uh, that company's uh, Brazilian unit. Um, so I'm just going to quickly review uh, the company's revenue generation and then we'll go ahead and jump into the code share uh, deal. Um, Azul's uh, revenue is primarily driven by uh, passenger ticket sales. The cargo revenue rose 41% annually in the first quarter and 26% in March alone compared with the same period in 2019. Um, as a percentage of total operating revenue, the cargo services represented about 5.3% in the first quarter. Um, with respect to the code share agreement, uh, to enhance its, passengers, its passenger operations, Azul entered into a co-chair agreement with LATAM Brazil to connect uh, their respective domestic networks, um, which provides customers of both airlines with immediate access to a total of 35 non-overlap routes in Brazil. At the end of August, the two airlines will actually begin sales on another 29 routes, uh, 12 of them operated by Azul and 17 operated by LATAM Airlines. Um, so what this means for um, passengers of Azul and LATAM is that they can purchase tickets on routes operated by either company and then apply their frequent flyer miles uh, to any program of their choice. Um, the program also uh, streamlines the baggage experience uh, to provide for check-ins through to final destination checking.
Um, so in, in all, it adds to Azul's strategy to expand its network in Brazil and provide for a more streamlined experience for passenger. And I think with that, uh, we are going to conclude with a question and answer session. And that concludes the slide portion of our presentation today. We will now move on to the Q&A portion. You can submit questions through the Q&A widget in the top left-hand corner of your screen. Okay, let's see what questions have come in so far. So it looks like we have a question on Aeromexico, unsurprising. Um, so um, Aeromexico filed its dip motion last night. Can you walk us through some highlights? Um, and then there's another one similarly that has come in. Um, what kind of progress has Avianca made on negotiating its dip? So Catherine, do you want to take the question on Aeromexico and I can do the one on Avianca? Hey, yeah, I think that sounds great. And um, given that we're short on time, I'm just going to uh, quickly walk through the salient features of the DIP financing, and uh, we'll just kind of take it from there. Um, so as Kyle said, yesterday, Aero Mexico filed a DIP motion um, to enter a commitment letter with Apollo Management Holdings. Uh, the proposed financing is definitely larger than we expected. It's a billion dollars instead of the 500 million to 700 million range that we, that we had previously heard. Um, the maturity date is 18 months after the petition date, and the facility is uh, is is a two tranche facility. So the first uh, tranche is a uh, the secured term loan facility for 200 million, a portion of which uh, may be uh, open to uh, like certain third party providers. Um, and other financial institutions and government entities, um, provided that they receive uh, the support of Apollo and Aeromexico. And the second tranche is a, a secured term loan for $800 million that is convertible into equity of the reorganized firm, um, again, um, with the support of Apollo and Aeromexico. And uh, lenders under the second tranche uh, can elect basically to receive in exchange for their claims common stock or limited voting rights in uh, an amount um, equal to the pro rata uh, share of the super priority claim plus any of any fees that apply. And uh, the collateral on the DIP facility includes airport slots at major hubs such as Heathrow and uh, JFK, unencumbered um, intellectual property, um, access value in the loyalty program or like unencumbered uh, cash accounts at the PLM um, entity, and then commercial real estate. And uh, just going back to other parties that are welcome to participate in the DIP financing, um, again, subject to Apollo and Aeromexico consent, uh, for instance, uh, members of the ad hoc group of 7% note holders as of August 12th um, can provide up to 50 million of the first tranche, which, is rep which represents about 25% of the uh, first tranche of DIP financing. And then um, the ad hoc group can also provide up to 125 million of the second tranche, um, which represents about 15.6% of that facility. Um, and the, uh, the commitment letter with Apollo contemplates a 12 million breakup fee. And um, it's, uh, I would just also note, I think this is important, that the advisors to Aero Mexico note that um, they, if, if the debtor can't quickly process the DIP facility, they may not be able to operate their business in ordinary course starting you know, as early as late September or October 2020. And um, in terms of kind of like next steps, what people can pay attention to, there's going to be a hearing on the DIP motion um, before Judge Chapman on August 17th at 10 a.m. Great, thank you. That was that was very thorough. Um, and uh, with regard to Avianca, um, Goldman is having um, a a lender call um, in, in a few minutes at 11, um, and commitments for the the dip, according to sources, are due um, August 20th. Um, so it seems like that that those negotiations are progressing, though um, you know, the details for now. Uh, are a little unclear, um, but certainly the, the negotiations do seem to be progressing along. And so now we'll get to our next question. With respect to the LATAM dip, is there any further clarity 
on when, when that matter will come to a conclusion. And um, I can take this one. Um, so I, I, I think that right now, um, you know, after the most recent um, hearing, uh, Judge, Judge Garrity um, of the Southern District said that he is set to decide quickly on the Latham dip motion. Um, that was uh, August 5th. Um, so, you know, I think, I think right now it's, it's, it's just a matter of waiting um, for the court's decision, um, you know, the, the Judge Garrity did approve um, the nine and three quarter million um, breakup fee uh, payable to Oak Tree. Um, so you, we, we've got that sort of down. Um, and then uh, there is an omnibus hearing on um, August 19th, I believe. Um, so maybe we'll have more information um, between now and then. And the next question that has come in also related to LATAM Airlines. Um, why did LATAM Airlines file for Chapter 11 instead of Chapter 15? Um, so I can take a stab at this. Um, I think the reason that LATAM Airlines filed for Chapter 11 as opposed to um, Chapter 15 is that um, the, the debtors determined, um, based on uh, a plethora of, uh, you know, contracts, um, assets, ca cash, um, and operations um, in the U.S., and, and, and more specifically maybe in New York, um, that it, it, it made more sense uh, to file Chapter 11 as opposed to filing a, a foreign main proceeding in, in Chile, for example, and then filing the Chapter 15. I would also note that, um, you know, as, as Roberto touched upon in his slide, uh, there is a lot of, I would say, a lot more certainty um, in filing Chapter 11 specifically in, in the Southern District, which, you know, has, has held um, or heard um, some, some pretty large uh, airline cases in the past. Um, so I think, I think it was a, a factor of uh, certainty um, as well as just, um, you know, assets and, 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 and various contracts that are New York law governed. And, and, and for those reasons, it, it just sort of made more sense. And I think the last one, Maybe we have time for one more. Are there any updates with regard to BNDS support, sorry, BNDES support for airlines? Um, Roberto, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So um, the negotiations are, uh, are ongoing, um, and there's kind of plenty of news uh, stories going around. Um, and plenty of speculation, but but nothing too concrete um, at the moment. Um, the figures are still uh, kind of around two billion uh, per airline. So for um, for each of the Brazilian airlines, to TAM, um, uh, Azul, and and Gol, um, and kind of. Th those figures also match, um, you know, the comments that, that I mentioned um, Richard Lark talked about in his presentation in the goal uh, earnings call. Um, so I think there's there's uh, truth to, to that, um, but we're going to have to wait and see. There isn't anything too concrete. Um, it, it's worth noting that in theory, you'd expect uh, kind of a parallel hypocritical judicial to be filed for um, for a company like like TAM, um, but the reason that the uh, the Brazilian subsidiary hasn't filed a parallel RJ um, is that it could affect the the chances of getting the NDS funding um, because that would get would go against the the bank's commercial terms uh, to lend to a company in RJ. Um, so you could also kind of uh, see that determining the the course of future. Uh, filings for some of the airlines as well, um, and some of this interesting discussion uh, around whether um, you know uh, companies should file in in Brazil or not. 
Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. And um, I guess we have one quick one before we go. Uh, how should we think about goals ability not to file for bankruptcy protection? I think quickly just, you know, want to address that one. Um, you know, I, I think what Roberto said is, is pretty closely to related to goal, goals ability um, to, to sort of stay out of bankruptcy. At this point, um, you know, we do want to avoid speculating about, um, you know, the probability of a, of a company of that nature sort of filing. But I would note um, that, A, yes, uh, certainly the BNDES support will, will, will play a role and, and how, what, what that support looks like, how much it is, when it comes in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would also note that, that, I, that as I mentioned in my slides, um, you know, goal – uh, with their their sort of heavy operating lease uh, capital structure, if you will, um, I think I think has a little more uh, capital structure flexibility um, to to manage some of those liabilities. Um, and then the the big wild card, of course, is is the delta term loan. I mean, from where we are sitting, it's difficult for us to know um, sort of how that that those talks if if they are going on um are progressing what delta's stance is so i think um you know that that it remains to be seen uh what the what the outcome of that is and and you know uh, it, it could range probably from ca some sort of cash pay down partial cash pay down amend extend I, I i think it's tough to tell at this point though um and with that i think that's all the questions we have time for today, um, if you have a few minutes, please take the survey that's going to appear on your screen in a few moments. Your feedback is very important to us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and have a great weekend.